From Number 5 Chambers, I'm Richard Kimblin. In this two-part edition, the planning podcast turns to planning appeals. A small proportion of planning appeals is dealt with by the inquiry and hearing procedures. Most of those appeals, of course, being against refusals of applications to local planning authorities. But many of the most important matters to come before inspectors are not against simple refusals. They, of course, include non-determination appeals, applications called in by a minister for the minister's own determination, and inquiries into objections against compulsory purchase, highways and various infrastructure orders. But the activity of resolving the issues is common to all. The framework for the conduct of such appeals is disparate. It is to be found in the 1990 Act, the Development Management Procedure Order, very many different sets of statutory instruments which set out the particular rules for the particular procedure. Planning Practice Guidance, the Planning Inspectorate's Procedural Guides, Case Law, which frames what is fair in both the hearing and inquiry modes, and in Codes and Rules of Professional Conduct. Though the general approach was settled in 1957 via the Franks Committee, the current rate of change is substantial, prompted by the Rosewell Review and since March 2020 by the pandemic. So, it's complex, it's disparate and it's dynamic. Perhaps that is why nobody has grappled with it in the form of a book. Now, very many others are better placed and definitely more able to tackle the task than I am. Certainly, if you get to read it, I would really welcome contributions from anybody who cares to use it and who either agrees or disagrees with any of the approaches taken. I hope that it helps. I hope that it helps all participants to make the most of their case as effectively and efficiently as possible. So, having put the proofs to bed and the whole thing gone off to the printers, it has been a great pleasure to talk to somebody who has looked so carefully at the system and to compare notes. Bridget Rosewell's insights have been very valuable indeed in their written form in the Rosewell Review. But as we will hear, they have still greater impact in conversation. Bridget, hello, good afternoon, how are you? Good afternoon, I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. Now, the Rosewell Review has finished, but has your involvement completely finished? Well, I occasionally get in touch and and ask how things are going, are there other things we should be doing? We did a review, I made a, a, a presentation a year after its publication, which was, well, actually, that's nearly a year ago even, oh, golly to really to make sure that the reforms were working, to see if there were other things we had to do, whether consultation on things like hybrid inquiries and different forms of funding uh, inquiries were moving forward, and particularly on the technology side, really to just keep things, you know, pushing along. Keep things pushing along. Do Do you think that things have pushed along? Well, actually, rather surprisingly, Yes. In fact, one somebody said at one point in, a, in some webinar or other that mine was the only inquiry that had achieved anything in planning in the last decade or two. I don't think that's quite fair. Well, I think you should, you should accept the flattering comments. Oh, maybe I should. I thought it would be possible to bring down the length of time it takes from putting your appeal up to when the inquiry is completed and the decision made from year to six months. And that has proved eminently possible. And indeed, anything which is uh, done under the Rosewell rules is happening in six months. Uh, And I think that there are probably two key aspects which have made that work. One is the early appointment of an inspector who looks at it, uh, decides what sort of representations and what the key issues are that need to be examined and which of them need a proper cross-examination. 
and the requirement to have a pre-inquiry call within six weeks of the appeal being lodged, at which all the interested parties can get together and make a, some you know, mutual decisions about where, when, how, and, and what is going to be examined in what way, whether by written reps or whether by round tables or indeed by full cross-examination. Well, I agree with you. That is the point of the review, which has had by far the biggest impact. The, the ability to get everybody together, as you say, in front of somebody who is either a senior or is going to be the inspector for the appeal event has made a huge difference. Yeah, and it should make sure that you've, you're looking at the right things. Now, it obviously then it does re rely enormously on how inspectors are being trained and that they are both picking up the right issues for cross-examination, but equally managing the things which don't need to go to cross-examination in the right way. And I have had some people push back and say, some things have gone to written reps, which should not have done and should have benefited from full cross-examination. I have to say, it's usually barristers who tell me this. So who knows whether, they, uh, whether they're actually right or not. But I can see there might be some potential in that area. But on the whole, I think that it's, it might need a bit of time to bed in properly, but it's the, the timetables work. They do. And I don't know of anybody who would say that having the appropriate mix uh, of modes uh, is wrong. Uh, but I think that you're right. People are feeling their way through it. And I suspect that so far as the calling of evidence and cross-examination are concerned, that there is a difference of understanding as to what their roles might be. I, my experience is that inspectors very much think that it's necessary when there is testing required. But there's also, I think, an important aspect, which is the ability to hear what the answer is to your case. So the ability to put your case to the other side and find out whether or not there really is an answer to it. Uh, and also to persuade through the calling of evidence to have the person who is expert to, you know, bring them to the table and say, look, this person says this, show them they're wrong. So it's that sort of balance of features, which is the beauty of that part of the inquiry procedure. But there are other things, particularly in parts of five-year land supply and some other matters, legal submissions, that they're, they're just, they're not apt for the calling of evidence. And to have a mix of modes is, is really a benefit in that respect. I says, I, well, that's my view anyway. Well, I think also making sure that expert witness is, is, you don't have to have a witness for everything and you concentrate the witness input and the expert input on the things which are really going to make a difference. One change that I didn't make that I wanted to, and, and they are working on guidance, I wanted to change the name of the statement of common ground. Okay to the statement of uncommon ground. In other words, what... You wanted to know the disputes. Exactly. Don't tell me that you agree the site is where the bloody site is, excuse my language, which I've seen, I've seen statements of common ground, which, you know, really are agreements about trivialities and don't really tell you what the nub of the matter actually is. Uh, and so I, I did at one point think that maybe we should change that whole piece. And I slightly backed off that because they said they would work on how guidance is given to the sort of topics that should be in the statement and the sort of topics that don't need to be in the statement and how the thing should be dealt with. And that is actually maybe something I should follow up on a bit more. And in fact, there is precedent because in DCOs, you do have to make those sorts of statements about the areas of disagreement rather than the areas of agreement. So I think we can still make those improvements and I think we probably need to reflect on the way that the pre-inquiry meeting is, is going and whether we're getting that absolutely right. I wonder if it comes down to identifying not only main issues, which is what one gets to at the moment, identifying the, the main issues which will ultimately result in the findings in the decision letter, but also trying to identify the issues within the issues. What is it? that causes the parties to disagree about the visual impact. You know, where, where is the visual impact that 
people are exercised about. What you're saying is you need to get people further down the the analysis, and it's it's harder work, isn't it? So I, I guess that's why it doesn't get done. Yes, I mean certainly interesting. You mentioned visual impacts because that was certainly one of the areas where people kept saying really cross examination doesn't help, and the round tables and going to look uh, and that sort of examination, if you like, is is a much better way of thinking about the visual side of things than to try and test something in a in a more confrontational environment. Yes, well, one, I'm sure, understands that, having seen some inquiries of that sort. But in fact, in the book, I draw attention to wind farm appeals, which are now not so common. But when they were prevalent, there were matters which did need to be cross-examined upon. And I refer to the Mid Wales Wind Farm Inquiry, which did proceed to deal with landscape and visual via the calling of evidence and cross-examination, but in fact dealt with things like policy by round table. It was an interesting sort of precursor to the, exactly the format that, that you alighted upon. But I can well see what sort of feedback you will have had from other people on things like the visual. But does it really come to this that we don't want a, a sort of template in respect of a statement of common ground? What we want is the professionals involved to properly apply their minds and to be collaborative and cooperative to the extent that they can state what it is that's stopping them agreeing. Yes, exactly. And and in fact, maybe we need to put a little bit more pressure on the experts, but then you, you need to have got them in early enough to make that possible. I mean, quite often I've been involved in the debate around a statement of common ground, having been brought in as, as an economist and, and you know to do the economic viability or economic impact uh, quite late on. So you're then ending up in a debate with, with somebody who is, if you like, on the, as you say, on the other side, seeing it from a different perspective, shall we say. And you're trying to work out what you agree about and you disagree about but when it's actually quite late in the process. There's nothing much you can do about that, actually. So you can't always get this stuff as you would absolutely like it. And after all, one whole point is to get to the number of, of issues speedily so that you can then spend the right amount of time investigating them, whether that's an economic issue or an environmental issue or a visual issue or a transport issue. Transport, you know, that goes on and on, doesn't it? There's always a transport issue. There, there always is. Uh, at least local people will always raise traffic and transport as an issue. I completely agree yep. with that. But I, I suppose where you have this example of uh, an expert coming in relatively late into the process, that's where your approach of changing culture really might help because the culture ought to be, regardless of whether you come into it early or late, the, the onus is upon the professionals involved to progress the resolution of those issues as far as they can. And that's really what the Barrister's Code of Conduct aims at, because they should be assisting the particular tribunal and furthering an overriding objective in the same way that they would in a, in a court case. And regardless of whether it happened at the time that it should have happened, by the time you get to the settling of the evidence, we really ought to know what the real differences are. Yes, that's true. But it is just, I'm just saying that's the council of perfection. And I suppose to achieve that, what you also need is inspectors who are able to get to the heart of the matter quite early on and have building up experience. I think we probably need to have in quite often more than one inspector sitting so that you have a junior inspector who is sort of learning from the more senior one how to do this. After all, if you think, if you become a judge, generally you've been a barrister or a solicitor, you know, you, you've, you've seen the system working. People come in to be inspectors who may not actually have actively seen the, the system working. They may come in from other walks of life or they may come in through only having, say, local authority experience. And so how do you give them the right skill and training to be able to exercise professional judgment and, and sometimes be a bit bold on that. So I think that uh, we, we forget about how to get people to do this well. Uh, and that means probably something a little bit more collaborative 
you know, we, we're, we're quite legalistic sometimes in inquiries about, you know, you have to go off on your own at lunchtime and, and all that stuff. A bit court casey. Uh, um, do we need to be as as pernickety as that? Because the inspector is an inspector rather than a judge. Yeah, well, you, you, you bring that back to the sorts of considerations that were at issue before the Franks Committee. Golly, that's okay. getting back, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But they, they were absolutely concerned with the same question, the, the point of over judicialising inquiries, which they shouldn't be. And that's exactly your point. And there's no particular reason why that ought to be the case, not least because at first instance, so to speak, when the planning authority makes a decision, it's not dealing with it in a judicial fashion. It's a group of councillors who gather together and knock the point around. Indeed. And I think planning inspectors have worried about becoming But because they've become very anxious about judicial reviews, which after all is a legalistic process, I think that's the route by which this is actually not just true of of planning. I think there's a a general move in this direction, which is not hasn't necessarily been helpful. It's sort of thing that Jonathan Sumption talks about, which has moved to generally make more legalistic too many of the processes and the policies with which we run society. But that's perhaps too big a point for this particular discussion. The minute that you introduce Lord Sumption and all of those issues, then we, uh, we've we expanded the scope quite a lot, we have haven't, rather, we? Yes, haven't we? We should probably, <laughs> we should probably uh, back off. <laughs> now, do, do you think that the matters we've just been speaking about just apply to residential appeals? Oh, definitely not. Although the spur to my review was because house builders had said one of the reasons they weren't delivering fast enough was that it took too long to get an inquiry decision. The inquiry processes work for all kinds of appeals and all kinds of inquiries and can work, you know, it applies just as much to an employment or a mixed use application as it does to anything else. Yeah. So wide application and becomes part of the new culture. And that's really achieved without any change to a rule uh, or to an act, albeit that there has recently been an amendment to the 1990 Act in respect of mix of modes. But really, everything that you sought to achieve was achieved by cultural and procedural change. Well, in fact, not even procedural change. It was more about everything that I did or that the review did. Well, actually, I think there are three important things. One, spent a lot of time with a group of advisors, including some senior inspectors. Two, we had roundtable meetings with in various parts of the country. Went out of London. Guess what? I went to Birmingham and I tried to go in, to various places around the country and have sessions which included local authorities and developers and lawyers and planners and you know experts and rule six parties you know everybody you can think of we invited 20 or so representatives of different stakeholders to come along and talk about it and out of that hopefully got a consensus did get a consensus on many of the things that needed to be changed or needed to be Delivered better, I suppose, is really what what I'm saying. So building up a set of things where you could say, we talked to everybody, we looked at all the numbers, you know, all of these these things are clear to very many people. So although some individuals didn't agree with everything, a lot of individuals agreed with much of it, which helps you to get acceptability for any proposals that you want to make. So that's really important for behaviours. And the second part was around picking up things which were already happening and simply trying to accelerate them. So there were already people doing in pre-inquiry meetings, for example, not for every inquiry, but for some. So let's take that and make it, it works. You know, there are all these inspectors who can say, this is how I do it. This is why it works, who could be advocates and you know, you know, trainers for this process. Let's pick that up and make it more general. 
to make that work, you obviously need an inspector who is already on the case, as it were, and who's looking at the application or the appeal that's gone in and, and is able then to run that pre-inquiry meeting. So now that immediately tells you you need to appoint an inspector at an early stage. So try to take the things which work, accelerate them, make them more general is hopefully one way that you can make real change reasonably quickly. Revolution is great, but, well, actually, probably isn't great because on the whole, <laughs> it throws a whole lot of stuff up in the air. And one of the things that was really important is to try and do changes which could happen quickly. And to make them happen quickly, you need to bring people along with you. So that's why I was very keen to do this by, by talking to people. Well, that's a brilliant summary. And what the word that I picked out there was accelerating. And part of your review alighted upon the virtual and the use of technology and involving people, the potential to have webcasting, etc. And we've had a certain amount of uh, acceleration since mid-March, haven't we? And uh, I wonder if you've had any thoughts about the way in which the virtual world has dominated many of our lives since then and how that might actually play out in some way. One looks for positives wherever one can in terms of the emergency. I wonder if you have any thoughts about how changes in the use of video, etc., might actually help the appeals process. Absolutely. In fact, we, I didn't really go down the road of a video link and everything, well, at least not as a particular recommendation. Partly, I suppose, two things. One was just getting pins into the place where they would accept or would be able to accept all documents uh, digitally was the priority. And they had had you know, problems with the software implementation and so on. I just really wanted to focus on their getting all that stuff right, because that's a prerequisite for being able to do everything else, after all, uh, digitally, video, what have you. We did talk about, when we talked about uh, inquiry locations, that we should require that everything should be live streamed, that there should be cameras available, that you should be able to watch the inquiry from somewhere else. And we talked about that, but I didn't push it that hard at that point because it just felt like they were already struggling to do rather more simple technology implementations and local authorities were pushing back to say, oh, well, I'm not sure we can do this. So the first thing was to get make it possible to have a wide variety of locations that you could use for an inquiry and then move towards that, that video position. And it's sort of interesting that subsequent to lockdown, actually the courts moved much more quickly than inquiries to um, enable yeah. online and at a distance inquiries. Although I do think as we've managed to go into this world and they are beginning to happen, and in fact, I've, I've sat on, on webinars with people in, uh, in, in, in rooms in which clearly there's an inquiry taking place, but not with anybody else in there. As we've moved to that, I think it's showing and hopefully will continue to show that you can get much better engagement, in fact, with a wider variety of people. So you're not undermining the sort of democratic aspect of an inquiry by holding it online. Yes. There are many things that happen better face to face, and I think probably cross-examination is one of them. But if you're live streaming the inquiry, then actually anybody can watch it, which actually helps for people who can't be there physically. But equally, to allow people to give evidence, particularly members of the public, to give evidence over a, over a Zoom when they've been Zooming and Skyping and what have you with their families for months, is in fact also easier and more engaging for many people than trying to hack over to an inquiry venue, take days off work, find somebody to look after the children, you know, whatever the arrangements are that you have to make, it would be much easier then simply to log on and then make your, make your statement and probably less anxiety inducing than finding yourself trying to make a statement in a, a rather confrontational arena. Yes, or at least in a large room with a significant number of people you've never seen before. Well, that is one aspect to it. But however it's arranged, as you know, I mean, you're used to it and I'm used to it. But you come into this room and there's the sort of the inspector and usually, well, at least up till now, lots of boxes of paper behind them. And then tables on either side with people 
you know, looking quite sort of official and professional, uh, it feels confrontational. Got it. So change of atmosphere is what you would point to. Mm. Excellent. Whether you're sitting at home and you're just sitting in front of the camera, you don't have anything like that sense with any luck. And you're on your own ground, not somebody else's. So I think it could be actually really helpful. And having had this experience, I mean, actually, I can be zoomed out. I can be over zoomed quite easily. But to do it for a bit and to uh, be able to sit back in your own home and not have to go anywhere, and particularly if you've got caring responsibilities or anything of that nature, you can now engage. I think that's great. Well, your your point is one that's amply supported by reference to the way that criminal cases accommodate people who don't want to face the formal situation of a courtroom. So mm. the giving of video evidence is, is provided for where that's an appropriate thing to do to assist the person who wants to give that evidence. And that's exactly what you're saying. You can have the necessary formal engagement for those who need to be engaged in it, but for other people, why should they have to put up with that if there's a perfectly easy, straightforward, low stress means of doing it? There's no real reason now why we can't do it. We've all been practising since March. Exactly. That's a really won wonderful insight. These aren't criminal after all. So I think if somebody prefers to do it that way, then they should. And if they prefer to rock up, again, they should. And if you know the, the expert witnesses need to talk with either the experts on the other side or indeed their colleagues, they can be there in the room. We can have a completely mixed approach to this. One stuff. can take a sort of hybrid, appropriate, appropriate approach yeah. for the respective parts of the process. Brilliant. No, that really is brilliant. The other thing, of course, with that, if you have one of the problems sometimes with inquiries is the expert or whoever has started on something and then dates get moved around and it all gets difficult. Well, actually, dates should get moved around less under a Rosewell inquiry because you're not allowed to. But nonetheless, you do get conflicts. And of course, if instead of having to be there at one end of the country or the other end of the country, if you can do it online, you can give your evidence and be cross-examined. It's not as good, but if otherwise there's a problem, it's a way of getting around it. Yeah, my, my take on that, having done quite a few by now, is that it's highly specific to the type of evidence being given. Mm. There are certain witnesses for whom it is a wonderful way to deal with their particular contribution at lower cost and not so much energy and time spent on motorways. Yeah, There are other types of evidence. And one of the examples which I think of is, is the occasion on which we had to um, assist an inspector with the effect of new housing, particularly with respect to their radiation from microwaves, etc., which would interfere with the nearby radio telescope, which was collecting the electromagnetic radiation from pulsars, with, which would have been interfered with. And the astrophysics, I don't think, would have come out terribly well done remotely. <laughs> but so providing you're not dealing with astrophysicists, you're probably you're probably safe to do more of it by video and save save everybody time and money. Absolutely. Now, I have to, at this stage, I think, mention Brindle, who's been deprived of Brindle's walk. Well, he has. Well, or at least his... No, during the course of our conversation. His play. Ah. Just as we were starting, he appeared with his toy and wanted to play with it. And that involves a squeaky toy and then playing tug of war. Well, I think we ought to have proper regard to all participants here. And... and <laughs> <laughs> now, what I do know is that those people who listen to this will be immensely grateful to you for taking the time to provide that really insightful view into the way inquiries are changing. So thank you, Bridget, very much indeed for spending that time and for, to Brindle for waiting, waiting okay. for playtime. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I've enjoyed it. That was good and good to meet you. We've never done a case together, so um, good to meet you. On another occasion, I'm sure. Maybe. Yes. OK. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. That was The Planning Podcast, the first part of the Planning Appeals edition. As I said in introducing Bridget, her ideas have still greater impact in conversation. There is a big point in that for anybody considering how to communicate their case to an inspector. 
communicating orally is often key to getting your point across accurately. That is one topic which we pick up on the planning podcast in the second part on planning appeals, where we are fortunate to have the experience and learning of James Corbett Bircher, JCB, on the way in which appeal preparation and management is panning out and some further insight into the mix of virtual and physical presentation of evidence. <laughs>